Heading into their match against Chattanooga Red Bulls, the Lexington Sporting Club has conceded seven goals in five games, the second most goals conceded in the entire USL League One. And this game ended with a catastrophic meltdown, where they conceded three more in the last 15 minutes. So what's been going on with Lexington Sporting Club? If you enjoyed this video or learned something new, it'd mean a lot if you liked the video and subscribed to my channel. I'm planning on making many more film breakdowns and scouting report videos like this, so let me know what games or teams you'd like for me to take a look at next. To be completely honest, Lexington was just a bit unlucky in this game to give up three goals. The first was off a corner, the second was a slip from the Lexington goalkeeper, and the third was at the very end of the game when Lexington had committed a lot of players forward to try and scratch their way back into the game. But for most of this game, Lexington's defensive structure actually wasn't that bad. In my last video, I detailed extensively the disconnect between Lexington's pressing group, the front six, and their back line. Oftentimes there'd be a 20 or 30 yard gap between the center mids and the back line, a space that Tormenta was able to put players in and take advantage of throughout the game. However, in this game, they were much better in that regard. With their standard 4-4-2, Lexington was again in a 2v3 situation in the midfield, with Chattanooga coming out in a 4-2-3-1. But here, Lexington started number 9, Will Bainham, in front next to Diouf, in replacement of Khalid Balogun or Drew Patterson from previous games. Bainham's impact offensively could be felt immediately. He worked hard in the press and was more attentive to cutting off the passing lanes to the Chattanooga pivots. Like in this clip, even when he pressed the Chattanooga center backs, he made sure to have the pivots in his cover shadow so the ball could not be played there. This is the key to better defensive shape for Lexington, because when Lexington's two forwards are able to cover the Chattanooga pivots, they no longer had to be covered by Lexington center mids. Thus, Lexington center mids were able to sit a bit deeper, covering that space in the middle of their formation that was previously wide open, cutting forward passing lanes, and making their overall defensive structure much more solid. Chattanooga quickly discovered this as they struggled to break down the Lexington defense in the first few minutes of the game. But sometimes, Lexington center mids still got sucked up into the Chattanooga pivots, which, similar to the Tormenta game, allowed those penetrating passes to be played. In this clip, they got bailed out by a bad flick pass from the Chattanooga forward but it ultimately resulted in a dangerous challenge in the yellow for Lexington center back not even 5 minutes into the game. This leads to one of the weaknesses in Lexington's defensive structure, in that they still struggle with opposition players in the gaps between their midfield and back lines. Many times throughout this game, Chattanooga's center attacking mid or forward were able to either check back and receive the ball unmarked, or could get the ball at their feet between the lines. This is largely due to the fact that Lexington is outnumbered in the middle of the field, and that they don't have that third, deeper center defensive mid to protect those central spaces. But this whole problem can easily be fixed with better communication between the back lines and the center mid. If the back line tells the center mids from which direction the checking players are coming from, then they can be better prepared to prevent these passes. Arguably, a bigger weakness in Lexington's structure, particularly in this game, was the wide areas. Because of Lexington's high press, their wingers often were pressing Chattanooga's wingbacks. So, if Chattanooga could beat the press, they found lots of space down the flanks. This is because Chattanooga's wingers were usually 10 to 15 yards off of Lexington's back line, thus forcing Lexington's wingbacks to have to make a decision. If they stepped up to the Chattanooga wingers, then it left their center backs 1v1 in a lot of space against Chattanooga's quick forwards. Chattanooga was able to take advantage of this a few times, with number 15 finding himself 1v1 in space against Lexington's center back Caitlin Fox multiple times, and often coming out the better. Here, look at how high up Lexington's far side wingback is to cover the Chattanooga player. A bit less lofted of a ball and 15 would be dribbling right at Kalen Fox in so much space. This occurred often in transition too, as Lexington likes to push their wingbacks forward on offense. So when they lose the ball, they're often out of position to help with the defense. This is kind of the price you pay for pushing your wingbacks so far up and trying to get numeric overloads offensively. You sometimes leave yourself susceptible to counterattacks in transition. Here, even though Lexington lost the ball deep in the attacking third, Chattanooga center mid has the vision to immediately ping the ball to the opposite corner into space to allow their number 15 to attack the slower Lexington center back. If I were an opposing manager, this is the part of Lexington's defense that I'd attack the most, especially if you have quick and crafty wingers. And if you're Lexington, to prevent this, you've got to ensure that you don't lose the ball in dumb spots, like in this clip. And when you do lose the ball, to apply pressure immediately to prevent the opponent from playing that long switch pass. But what if Lexington's wingbacks sat back to help their center backs? In that case, because Chattanooga's wingers stayed a bit deeper and were able to get the ball at their feet, Lexington's center mids were forced all the way out wide to cover. 
This opens up tons of space in the middle that Chattanooga wasn't able to take advantage of in this game, but that other teams might be able to in the future. And the last thing, towards the end of the game, there were a series of set pieces in which Chattanooga was able to catch Lexington in the space between their back and midfield lines. I know Lexington wants to push people forward right now because they're down, but you generally don't want your center backs to be the ones going for these headers, and the reason is shown here. If you don't win the ball, you're an unlucky bounce away from a dangerous counterattack because you pulled your center back out of position. Here, you'd want your center mids to be deep enough to be challenging for that ball, as you can always step forward if the ball's a little bit shorter, but dropping back is a lot harder. Now, this video wouldn't be complete without a look at Lexington's offense. On offense, I actually thought that Lexington was much better in this game, and I believe that playing Will Bainham up front made a huge difference. Bainham is much more willing than previous forwards to check back and look for the ball. He was a much better target, able to find space to receive the ball and develop play. Lexington also made better runs and played off the ball quicker, leading to some early shot opportunities. This is a clip I want every young player to see. It just shows that you making a run may not get the ball, but it can open up the space for your team to attack. So Lexington's forward makes this run out wide, and he doesn't get the ball, but what he does is that he drags the center back out with him. This opens up the space down the middle for this ball to be played for number 77 to run onto it like that. A bit better of a ball, and it's a 1v1 to goal, or a penalty, but they still get a dangerous foul out of it. So some people may ask, how do you know what runs to make? Well, one of Pep Guardiola's key offensive principles in the build-up is that, when you commit defenders, it opens up the space they once were. Thus, his build-up philosophy is to commit defenders, attack the space they vacated, commit more defenders, and etc and etc. Here, the ball coming to number 3 commits the Chattanooga wingback opening up the space behind him. Lexington's forward makes a run into that space, forcing the Chattanooga center back to commit into that space as well. Thus, it opens up the space right in front of goal, that Lexington is able to attack and win a nice foul. These are the things that you've probably done before in your own games, but likely on accident. I'm just trying to show you the principles behind why these things work so you can spot opportunities going forward and be more intelligent and intentional in your runs and understanding of space. However, it wasn't all perfect for Lexington, and in more advanced areas, decision making was still poor, especially in terms of determining when and where to attack. Take number 18 here as an example. In this position, you essentially have nothing but red shirts in front of you. But just because you have space, you decide to drive forward into no man's land. Thus, at this point, you've eliminated all of your options except for a hopeful pass to a striker who's got a man draped all over him. When you're on the ball, be patient and make good decisions. Yes, you do have space to dribble forward, but going into that space just closes all of your options, and you're gonna lose the ball. In this case, you just wanna recycle it, play it simple. Number eight is calling for the ball. You have multiple options out wide and behind you. There are so many options and there's really no need to be driving forward here. This is another example. If you're Lexington center mid here, just play the simple ball to number 32. He's wide open, and he has a man through on the far side, and he's asking for it too. What ends up happening is, you play it to number 18, and he loses the ball. Even if you wanted to play number 18, you're not the man to do it, as this center mid is in the way of this passing lane. Then, taking three touches, and waiting for the center mid to move out the way, takes way too long. The center back can read that ball coming from a mile away. Just play 77 or 32, and then let them play that pass there. They both have better angles on that ball. As the center mid, you don't always have to be playing that penetrating pass, the through pass, or that long switch. You should just be worried about playing the right pass, and oftentimes it's a lot simpler than you think. Those are just some of the more noteworthy examples. Overall, I think Lexington showed a lot of improvement in this game compared to previous performances. Again, they were a bit unlucky to concede three goals at the end of the game, but that's just how soccer is. A momentary lapse or a single mistake can drastically change the outcome of a game. However, in totality, it's good to see that Lexington is improving each game and building on previous performances. While their league standing isn't too hot at the moment, they're still a brand new team with a brand new set of players who are still getting used to each other. For a young team like Lexington, as long as you're continuously getting better, that's all you can really ask for. As the season continues, I'm excited to see how this team grows and evolves throughout the year. Thanks for watching, I'll see y'all soon.